This video will speak directly to you. In this video, I get pretty passionate and emotional at certain points because what we're talking about is the difference between success and failure. I want my students to succeed. In two recent coaching sessions, we drafted up a list of things that the student had to work on. And I got thinking, these focus areas that we wrote down, these rules about why they're not achieving their goals, they apply to loads of you. They probably apply to almost all of you. There were 10 reasons we're going to go through in today's video. We're going to look at hand histories that exemplify them as we go, played by students that we've gone over in coaching. And I would think that seven or eight of them will apply to every one of you if you play some micro stakes, low stakes game. I hope you enjoy this video. It was a blast to make it. I definitely got totally absorbed in the experience. It's a subject I'm super passionate about. And if you like this coaching content, do check out carrotcorner.com for the Carrot Poker School, our theoretical course, and more. Let's get to the video. I've taken many students and got them through the micro and low stakes, got them winning at this game. And it's never as difficult or as complicated as they were making it out to be before they got coaching. It's amazing how people think they have to do things that they just don't have to do and are unaware of the really simple things that they do have to do to beat micro stakes and low stakes poker. So whether you're playing 10 NL, 25 NL, 50 NL, 1, 2 Live, 2, 5 Live, 100 NL, this video is for you. If you're struggling at any of these stakes, we're hopefully going to get you winning. This video alone might not fix all of your problems, but I do hope to diagnose 10 things that are holding you back. The 10 things on my list today come from sessions that I did recently with my own private students playing similar stakes. I wrote up session notes from two of these coaching sessions and sent them to the students as I like to do. And in these sessions, it was a gold mine. We really unearthed a lot of stuff. So this hand here comes from 25 Russian cash on GG Poker, played by one of my students. And this hand illustrates a really important rule. Reason number one why you may well not be beating micro and low stakes poker is that you are missing mandatory bluffs. That's bluffs that you absolutely have to make. Exhibit A, cut off opens here and we peel the 3-9 of hearts, the old 39 in the big blind. Don't do this. On GG Poker, Russian cash 25 and L, the rake is pretty horrible. This hand is not going to be great against the men open, unless the player is like really bad in some way or really passive or is going to let you win too many pots. Maybe you can get away with this, but I think this is losing against most people. 7-jack-8, two-tone. We check and villain bet small here. I think you can raise with the backdoor draw and the 9 at some frequency. I think you can call as long as you don't fold. It's not really going to be a big deal. We decide to peel. The turn is the 5 of clubs. We check. Villain checks back. The river is the king of hearts. And now we reach a mandatory bluff spot. So when we've called this flop bet, we've shed tons and tons of air from our range. Okay, we can still have a little bit of 9x and a little bit of 10x, but not that much. The vast majority of our range has now improved. We've either hit a king on the river with king x of diamonds or king queen or king 10 that we floated with or something like that. Or we've hit two pair or we've hit a straight or we had a pair on the flop like a pair of jacks or a pair of eights. So when your range is this dense in made hands and so anemic in bluffs, you should be bluffing the bluffs that you have. Okay, this is not a fantastic river for your range, but the best line here is block bet. When you block bet here, what's happened is that your opponent hasn't protected their range enough at these stakes on the turn. So at this point in the hand, they've not checked back enough top pair, over pair, two pair. Their range is basically second pair or weaker for the most part. There are exceptions. So on the river, they're quite polarized to a really bad hand like ace four or ace queen or pocket threes or something like king queen or ace king that's just hit a king. They don't have enough jack x. So the best sizing against that overly polarized range is just going to be a block bet. And you should absolutely bet the river here. And we don't. And this check is hugely problematic. I asked the student here, I said, what the hell are you doing? How dare you? Do you expect to make it in poker? You don't deserve to play the game, son. That's what I said to him. And he said, well, you know, Pete, sometimes I'm just multi-tabling. I just don't notice things. And it's like, well, this is the kind of thing you really have to notice. If you make a habit out of missing these kind of plays, it adds up really quickly. So that's point number one. Do not miss mandatory bluffs. How can you tell when you have a mandatory bluff? You have a strong range that's condensed against a range that checked behind the previous street. This is a really important pattern. Or maybe you just opened pre. You have a range advantage. You were called and you checked all the way to the river and now you have air. You've still got a range advantage on most textures. You have to bluff. There are spots in GTO where your fold equity is way above and beyond the break even point, And this is one of them. In reality, you probably have even more fold equity here because people don't protect the turn checking range. Okay, on to the next one. 
Reason number two why you might not be beating low stakes and micro stakes poker is that you, my friend, miss delayed c-bet bluffing and delayed c-betting in general. Delayed c-betting is an incredibly profitable node because when people check once when they didn't have to, okay, they're pretty capped there. When they check twice when they didn't have to, they're really capped in real life. And this is a spot where Bella is checking once procedurally to the razor here, small blind against button. We can tell this is a weaker player, by the way, almost certainly, because very few regulars are going to flat small blind against button. So in this spot, when we check back the flop and the weaker player has a nine, GTO is usually going to check a nine on a jack turn. But a weaker player is going to bet a nine more than they're going to check it because you check back the flop and they have a second pair and they want protection or whatever. It could be a, a myriad of different reasons, but they're very often going to bet the nine. If they have a jack, their slow play frequency is going to be far below that of theory. Way, way, way below. When they have a draw like 4 or 5, they're usually just going to bet. They're not going to check raise you. GTO is going to check raise you. So you don't get check raised as much here as you should. You don't get check called as much as you should. People are just full of trash here. They just have so many bad hands, so many give up. So yes, with Ace-4, okay, you could say that you have a bit of showdown value perhaps. You could talk about that. But we're going to look at a spot later where you really shouldn't obsess over your showdown value. You're going to see why that is. But even in this spot, so what if you have a little bit of showdown value? So what if it's plus EV to check back like this? Oh, he didn't check back. He actually bet this one. My bad. <laughs> Student bet this one. We've been working on this skill, delayed C betting. And he's been saying I'm doing a lot more delayed C betting. So he got this one right, which is really good to see. And the reason this is a delayed C bet is that one, you can fold out lots of better hands, like just bigger ace high or like pocket fives or something sometimes. Two, you have a nutted branch of the tree where you bink an ace or bink a five and you win a big pot. That can happen too. And three, if you check here, while if you bet it would be really overfolded and you would have just won the pot an insane amount of the time and more often than you're even meant to in theory, which is a lot by the way, because you're meant to win a lot here when you bet in theory. Villain's not meant to protect their range to the extent that you're just breaking even by bluffing. You have a big range advantage, so they're supposed to just fold. They're supposed to overfold here compared to that mathematical break even point. But here's the thing. If you check here, you will lose the pot against loads of hands that would have folded turn because the river comes to six and villain bets and you just fold ace high because you're like, I don't even know if I beat their bluffs. So in spots that are really, really overfolded, but you're not getting punished because the line that punishes you here is the check raise and it almost never happens at 25 Russian cash on GG poker or any 25 in L game for that matter, then you should bet because this bet is just going to win the pot astronomically more often than it's meant to. This is a great play, but something that really holds people back is they get stuck in this sort of subconscious autopiloting mode of just checking down. Oh, I've got ace high, I've got some showdown value, I win sometimes. You have to compare checking to betting. If the spot's really overfolded, do consider betting anyway. Delayed c-bet spots are your friend. They're very profitable in theory, but they're even more profitable in real life. Delayed c-bet, the hell out of people. Bluff them with anything here. It doesn't matter what you have. If you have king four of clubs, bluff them. Stop looking for equity. Well, I'd bluff if I had queen 10. That's why you're not winning. That's your problem. You're not seizing the day in these gold mine opportunities against underprotected ranges. Delayed C-bet. Do it a lot. Bluff. Win money. Move up. Crush, etc. The third reason why you may not be beating low stakes poker is that you're missing value against passive opponents that aren't going to bet for you. A lot of your opponents in micro and low stakes are too placid. Like you. They're too placid. Like this student. It's just an epidemic. Solvers are way more aggressive than humans when we're talking about low stakes players. Almost universally. With the exception of maniacs. There are some redlining maniacs that still lose. They're the exception. Most people are too passive. So in this hand, we check ace nine in the big blind. Okay, you could maybe raise here. It's fringy. Not a big deal to check. King three eight rainbow. We check. Villain checks back. I don't think we have to probe here. We have quite a lot of showdown value and passive players will just check all the way to showdown. When they limp pre, they've already told us who they are. Who limps pre-flop and then checks twice? Who does this? Someone who's going to bluff the river? No, not someone who's going to bluff the river. Someone who's going to check down 9-7 of diamonds. The clue is in the action sequence. Action sequence equals player type equals range equals read. Let's do this explicitly. Action sequence is very passive. Player limped pre. Player is a passive fish. Usually just looking to show their hand down and only put money in when they have a good hand. That's usually who you're up against here. Equals range. A bunch of stuff that won't bet, but will often call because it's like a pair of eights or pocket sixes or pocket tens or king x or ace three. Ace deuce rather. Ace three beats you, but you get the point. Don't check here. The student said here, 
and I quote, well, I knew that he was supposed to bet with his heir, because in the carrot poker school we call that River Blundo theorem, this player has a range advantage. They've limped in when they didn't have to, we've checked in the big blind. This player has an absolutely monstrous range advantage and needs to bet 9 high, in theory. But we need to stop treating people as if they're going to do what they're supposed to do. We need to leave the solver realm and stop pretending that we're playing against a bloody solver, because we're not. You're going to have to bet here. Because passive players call way wider than they bet. That is the mantra. Passive players call way wider than they bet. They don't deserve to play the game. So bet. Take their money. Don't leave this money on the table. This is a terrible river check. It's really going to be a big problem. Point number four, why you're not beating low stakes micro stakes, is that you are not aware of inelasticity. A player is inelastic if and only if they do not react enough to changes in bet sizing with respect to the range they call or fold. So elastic ranges, perfectly elastic ranges, react in a kind of linear upward direction in terms of how much they contract as you increase your sizing. So as your bet size gets bigger, their continuing range gets smaller, and it does so in a uniform, gradual way. That's how a solver plays. It notices the difference between 1.3x pot and 1.4x pot. Do you? No, of course you don't. Don't even, no, 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 don't even pretend that you do. Stop it. Stop it. You don't notice. Stop it. You don't notice the difference. No, shut up. You don't. Can't believe I just had to argue with that guy. That was only like one of you or two of you had to argue with there. Most of you admitted that you don't know the difference. Good for you. That one guy that's still arguing with me. Yeah, seriously, just get a grip on reality, mate. This is a fucking joke. You don't notice. So 8.5, 8.5, 8, 5 suited. I don't know why I read that as 8.5. Open it up here and go for a big bet. So big bet here. This is a fish, by the way. Like we knew this was a fish. This is terrible. So what's going to happen here is that when you bet big, there will be a very minimal difference between their continuing range on this specific texture to a big bet as there will a small one. And the reason for that is that when you have hit a pair on this board, you don't fold. If you're a recreational player, you're just not folding to any sizing for the most part. If you have deuces or ace-deuce, you probably fold to everything. If you have a king, you probably don't fold to anything. If you have a jack, you don't fold to anything. Maybe the eight is a little bit elastic. We block the eight a little bit. So overall, there just aren't enough hands in a recreational player's range here which are sensitive to sizing. So you need to unbalance your strategy. You need to forget about building up Lego blocks of your range from the ground up. You need to stop doing that. Instead, you need to maximize your EV. You need to play your hand. You need to realize that you can have a strategy where when you have King Jack, you pot it. And when you have 8-5 of spades, you bet 25% pot. That's good. That's very good. Oh, but I'm unbalanced. You get the picture. Can't be unbalanced. I do a good slap noise, right? A good affirming slap. That's the kind of slap where you know that you've just improved your game when you receive it. Of course, it's only a verbal metaphorical slap. We don't promote violence at Carrot Corner. But then look at the violence you're committing to your red line when you do this. How about that violence? So yeah, too big. Don't like it with this hand. Be unbalanced. Don't even really like big bets here in general. Like they're fine with nutted stuff against fish, they're great. But in theory, they're not even that good here. Then we give up, that's what we should do. Um, we lose to Jack-10. Yeah, that hand was not sensitive to your sizing. Most hands aren't, that's the point. Be sensitive to elasticity, be unbalanced. Don't be afraid to be like, hey man, when I do this, all of my range is bluffs. And when I do that, all of my range is value. That's how you destroy micro stakes and low stakes. You don't fuck about like this. Point number five is not attacking lazy, sloppy range bets enough. This is an example of a lazy, sloppy, brain dead range bet. Is this border range bet in GTO? No. Not even close. It's like a 42% frequency or some shit. Tell me in the comments. Did I get that right? I guessed. Stu Unger Garments. Stu Unger Garments always tells me whether I got the frequency right in the comments. Another shout out to you, my friend. So, I call. Villain calls, hero calls, student calls, student, let's go with students. Not me, it's not villain, it's not hero, it's a student. The student calls, and it's fine, this is not a bad call, there's nothing wrong with this. But I said, were you ever raising here? And he said, nah, I was thinking I've showdown value. And there's two points here. My first point is, punish the hell out of lazy range betting. When they bet their entire range here, they get away with it because the pool just folds. The pool literally just like runs in the other direction and doesn't raise and just like comes up with all kinds of horrible self-imprisoning doctrine to avoid raising or I have showdown value. I would do it if I had a flush draw. I don't rep anything. I, I'm in position. I should just call all of this. When actually, if you just make it like six, 
in this spot. Let's make it small, like 570. This guy is like screwed with so much of the range bet range. Like he's gonna have to call ace queen, but he doesn't know that. He's gonna have to call ace jack, he doesn't know that. He can never fold any pair. He can never fold sixes. He doesn't necessarily know that. People are gonna overfold. Seriously, they're not gonna three bet you enough. They need to three bet you a ton. Not a ton, but sometimes when you make it small like that. Make it 550, make it six. This is something I talk about in grade E of the Carrot Poker School. I'm giving you a free bit of grade E information here. That's our mass data course that comes out in August. It's huge. Check it out. It's about 10, 11 hours long. It's on carrotcorner.com. It will be from August. If you're watching this in August, it's already there. If not, the theory course is there now. It's been there for a while now. Check it out. So this raise here, I'm not saying it's better than call with these three of clubs. Both lines are fine. But if you have a hand like queen 10 and you're like, I'm just going to fold my queen 10. Bad. Don't do that. Just click raise. It's way better. Your red line will thank you if you start raising these spots. We also talk about this in cash injection as well. Lots of other content on Carrot Corner about loads of this stuff and more. So the rest of this hand, the student then checks back the turn. This brings me to rule number six, not punishing checking ranges enough. Checking ranges are malconstructed. They're built like flimsy houses that crumble with a mere prod. The checking range of the 25 and L player is the pig that built its house out of straw or whatever the weakest house was. Is it straw, wood and stone? The solver builds its checking range out of stone. A decent reg at higher stakes builds it out of wood. And a 25 NL player fucking builds it out of like sheets of rice paper. Like not even proper paper, but like that paper that you can like put stickers on cakes with and eat. That kind of flimsy shit. Like it's embarrassing. This guy builds his checking range out of vermicelli noodles. Like it's literally just the thinnest, most flimsy thing in the world. So do you want to check here? And then be like, well, I have showdown value. Of course I check down. I win against queen high, sure. But would you not like to just win 85% of the time by betting turn? Because that's what will happen if you bet big there. You'll just win almost always. Villain will check raise you almost never at these stakes. And when you check back here, they're going to lead the river sometimes. They're going to reignite their bluff and you're going to fold. Even though you should just call, by the way, with ace high. And sometimes they'll be bluffing ace seven because they have no idea what's going on. But hey, you put yourself in that spot. Now you got call. The way you guys are playing, who are struggling to beat the micro sticks, is that you think that any showdown value is good enough to showdown. And that is just the biggest load of bullshit in the world. Because in poker, you're comparing lines. On the turn, rule six, we don't punish checking range enough. On the river, rule seven, don't overemphasize showdown value. One reason you guys are struggling is that you're thinking that whenever you have showdown value, you should check. This is so false. Okay, you don't want to commit big polarization mistakes the other side of the spectrum is betting way too out of control with the middle of your range for no reason. But this hand is flimsy, man. Like, it struggles to win on a lot of different nodes. It struggles to survive. And the fold equity is so great immediately, they should just bet. Okay, if you have ace-jack, now we can talk about checking. If you have sixes, we can check back. With ace-three, you should just bet. It's all real mix, by the way, because it's playing against someone that's good at poker. You have to remember there's a very big difference between solvers and their enemies who are good at poker and your real-life opponents who are not. Don't overemphasize showdown value, this river check. Okay, now that we've got here, meh, I guess it's okay. But honestly, you should bet the turn. Maybe you should bet the river is played anyway. 10-6, okay, it doesn't matter this time. Sure, but you win against that if you bet as well. And then all the other stupid shit that's just folding. And Villain just has too few check calls on the turn or check raises. That's the point. Rule number eight. Some of you guys are struggling because you make bad slow plays with big hands. You're slow playing in the wrong spots. Here's a spot in which my student slow played. And he shouldn't have. It was bad. Shame on the student. Shame. Go a bit Joe Biden. There. Shame on you, man. So we open. Call. Queen, queen, ace. Who is villain? Who is villain? That's right. Random fish. Probably of the aggro variety. We call. Absolutely the right play. This is a good slow play. Raising here is terrible. But now they check on a turn that's really merging to their range. When people donk pot on queen, queen, ace, they don't usually have nothing. It's possible, right, if the guy's an utter baboon, that he has nothing. Like he literally just has like four or five off. Sure. We called down recently against the three deuce off, remember? These maniacs exist. They are among us. They are walking among our communities. But most people here when they donk pot on the flop have an ace. Or they have a queen. Or they have like king jack. Or they have like jack 10. Or they have ace 10. Or they have a draw. Flush draw. Just bet big 
All these hands are calling, most of them anyway, especially if it's a maniac. They're not going to want to fold. They like absolute hand strength, remember, not relative hand strength. This check maximizes against utter shit, but people don't donk pot on queen queen ace very often with utter shit. So this is just that you're barking up the wrong tree with this slow play. You're not just losing the 14 big blinds or 20 big blinds or whatever that you don't put in on the turn, or a portion of that the times you get called, but you're losing the ability to exponentially build a massive pot by the river. And okay, the guy has nothing this time, but he probably has like four or five of diamonds or something that's going to like call the turn anyway for the hell of it. So I really like a, a bet on the turn. Maybe it doesn't even need to be a big bet, but like some kind of bet. Let's like build the pot. I think there's an instinct among low and micro stakes players to check because they're afraid their opponent's going to fold or bet too small because they're afraid their opponent's going to fold. This is nonsense. You need to maximize what you win these times you're going to get paid because that's where the money comes from in poker not slightly increasing the frequency that you don't make nothing. Yeah, well, I'd rather make, you know, two big blinds sometimes than, than, than get a fold. Pathetic. Pathetic. Okay, how many is that we've done? Eight? Something like that? Let's talk about folding against overbluffed lines. Point nine, you might be struggling because you fold in spots where people massively overbluff. See, when you fold in spots that people are hugely overbluffing, Red line, it falls off a cliff, it explodes on the rocks below. It's impossible to win with a red line that's plummeting downward at like an 80 degree angle. You can't do it. It's like trying to get through your day with like 50 kilogram weights attached to your arms. That's what it's like. Trying to beat a game that's high rake when your red line is pathetic is like trying to walk around with 50 kilo weights on each wrist. You just can't. You just have to like lie on the ground unless you're like hulkingly strong and have like really robust wrists. Like you're screwed. So you put yourself in a situation where you're making folds like this one I'm about to show you. That's what's going to happen. Let's take a look at the hand. The fold you're going to witness on the river in this hand from this student. It's a different student than the one we were just looking at, by the way, is awful. This is a really bad fold. This fold is the epitome of why people don't beat stakes like this, like 10 and L. Also, the rake is 4,000 big blinds per 100. That doesn't help, but this is certainly making life harder. So we call queen deuce, big blind against button, min raise, okay. Check, check. Three of diamonds on the turn. Seems like middle of range. Maybe they're so capped here that you can lead a third, and it's fine. Value denial, it's probably fine to lead a third, but check's okay too. Bill and bets half pot, easy call. Overbluffed spot. When you leave your opponent's range ridiculously wide, they're going to overbluff. They can't help it. They don't have enough good hands. They just don't play over pairs this way often enough. Not enough people in pool. Take an over pair or a 6-5 or pocket 8s or anything like that or a 3 and then check flop bet half pot. It just doesn't happen. This range is super, super overbluffed. It's like pathetically weak. It's actually embarrassing for villain how weak this range is. So, so called, sure. Now the ace comes on the river and their range is still just dog shit. They have a little bit of ace x but most of it's going to check the turn for showdown value. I mean, they do have showdown value there with ace-x, so that's actually perfectly legitimate. But you get the point. A lot of ace-x is going to check the turn, ace-4, ace-5, very often going to bet the flop. I just don't believe there's enough ace-x here for us to be losing 80% of the time. Because that's how often we're going to have to be losing to make this disastrous fold. This fold is so bad that it makes me want to be sick a little bit. I want to be sick a little bit in my mouth. But I'm holding it in. It's not a good play, because you're going to win here probably... 70% of the time and you need 20% equity that is three and a half times more often than you need to win and you've just folded your hand I'm not kidding when I say that by the way this line is so full of shit people are so bad at having a value bet with this exact line check bet bet on this run out there's, there's very few spots that are as overbluffed as this the ace river makes it more overbluffed because now they're not even value betting like they're six anymore a lot of the time they're just checking it because oh no the ace came a lot of our range is an ace this makes no sense. This is just totally overbluffed. It's a bluff like three quarters of the time and you're folding. So in the real world, sometimes things are incredibly different to what they are in the theory world, but you get a breed of player that studies religiously with solvers and only solvers at these stakes. Hell, you get coaches that tell people to just play like a solver at 10 NL and it's so sad. And it's actually just making everyone awful at poker, which is, oh, shouldn't you be happy people? No, I'm a coach, man. Hate that argument. Shouldn't you be pleased people are so bad? My job is to make people better. No. Okay. I like it that they're bad before they come to me because then I have a job. But I really want to fix this in people. So I really stress this quite heavily. This is important. Rule 10. 
This is a general rule. I'm gonna go full screen for this one. Rule 10 is a big one, and it is this. Stop trying to forge a strategy at the expense of making good choices. Have a think about that. Does it make no sense? Good, I made it deliberately cryptic, so you'd be like, what? Stop trying to forge a strategy. Okay, so what's a strategy? A strategy is trying to plan how your range is going to play. What frequency should I have for probing the turn? How often should I bet this hand on the river? I thought I would roll it and it was a low number so I didn't make an obvious mandatory bluff where checking is horrible. You get the point. When the macro takes precedence over the micro to such an extent that you're looking at everything from a bird's eye view 4,000 feet up in an aeroplane and you can't see the detail of what's on the ground and what's on the ground is really important to the EV of your choices, big problem. I find that far too many microstakes players and low stakes players these days, because they study with programs like GTO Wizard or Pile Solver, which is fine if you know how to use them. It's recommended, in fact, they've built a whole school on doing that, not on studying, but like taking the output, and distilling it so it's nice and easy and all of that. But when your focus becomes, I will just arbitrarily mix things and I'll roll an RNG in every spot and I'll worry about my bluff to value ratio. And I'll worry about my blockers before I've assessed whether the opponent's bluffing 75% of the time for one fifth pot, whatever it may be. That's a huge fucking problem. It's a colossal problem. And if this sounds like you, like you're putting your strategy before your range, you're comparing your accuracy to the accuracy of a solver, you're running hands in detail wizard and being like, how much theoretical EV did I lose with my river call? Probably none, but that doesn't mean it's not a fucking awful call. Okay? Yeah, I've been a bit animated and passionate today. I really hope this video is going to help you guys. I'll run over these again. Missing mandatory bluffs, missing delayed c-bets in overfolded spots, missing value against passive opponents, missing inelastic situations like the 8-5 of spades, not attacking enough versus the lazy range bets, not punishing the feeble checking ranges of your opponents, putting too much emphasis on showdown value and not enough on fold equity, making bad slow plays because you're afraid of people folding or undersizing your bets for the same reason, folding in overbluffed lines because you can't hand read, you'd rather just be like, oh no, an ace came, I fold. Trying to forge a strategy at the expense of making good choices. Make good choices. Every poker hand is the opportunity to make a good choice rather than a bad one. If you like the way we teach the game, carrotcorner.com for more of our stuff. We'll see you back here for another video very soon. Man, I need to calm down now. That was a lot of emotion. All right, see you later.